The following is how you use symbolic algebra and the concepts of conservation of energy and a little bit of Newton's laws to solve the classic undergraduate or high school level physics problem about the loop-de-loop. -loop. A small block of mass m moving at speed v0 enters the bottom of the circular vertical loop-de-loop -loop shown, which has a radius r. The surface contact between the block and the loop is frictionless, a major point. Determine each of the following in terms of m, v0, r, and g. In part a, we find the kinetic energy of the block when it reaches point p on the loop. This being a frictionless situation, I can assume that energy is conserved, which means my initial mechanical energy must equal my final mechanical energy, whatever form that mechanical energy may take, for whatever initial and final points that I choose. Here, I have a ground level and initial location, and a final location given by point P. What kind of energy is present in the initial case? Well, let's say we're on the ground, where there's no height. It's not potential energy, but it is moving. It has a known speed of V0. So, the kind of energy I have, the only kind, in the initial case is kinetic. So in place of the initial energy, I say kinetic energy, initial. Up here at point P, my final point, I've obviously gained some height. That height happens to be equal to the radius of the circle. But it's potential energy. It is not guaranteed that I come to a stop here, provided I had enough speed at the beginning. In fact, I was asked to find the kinetic energy of the block when it reaches this point, so it must have kinetic energy, according to the problem, and in fact, this is the variable we've been asked to solve for. Let's get specific with the kinetic energy initially. We know the definition of kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared. We say 1 half m v squared for kinetic energy initial and then specify v naught squared because that's the true initial velocity. The potential energy is mgh by definition but specifically the h is the lowercase r for the radius of the circle. We add this to the final kinetic energy or kep for the kinetic energy at point p if we want to be specific to the problem. We subtract mgr from both sides to yield this. And to clean things up, we factor out the common factor of m, yielding the result. This is the value of the kinetic energy at point P for a certain initial velocity and a certain radius of the loop. In part b, we're asked a more interesting question. What is the minimum speed of the block at the top of the loop such that it remains in contact with the track at all times? So you've gotten this far, and now your block is up here. It has a certain velocity, v min, that it needs in order to stay in the loop. But what does that mean? Let's consider Newton's laws. Consider the forces on the block at this point. We have, as usual, force of gravity. We'll skip straight to mg for that. But we also have the floor, which is above us. Normally we'd call that the normal force. I guess we could call it the normal force here too. It's just that it's pointing down. Altogether, these forces, under normal circumstances, come together to make the sum of all forces. But in this case, the sum of all forces is giving us circular motion. Therefore, this is a centripetal force. We can say that the centripetal force is equal to mg plus fn. What I've just done is said that the downward sense is positive. Since the centripetal force must be towards the center of the circle, that'd be down, and the 
mg and the normal force are also acting down. So I give them all positive signs because they all agree in direction. So here's the thing. The normal force, Fn, only exists, only comes into play if you have enough speed to leave the loop without it being there. Since we're looking for a minimum speed, we are going to zero this out. Indeed, the traditional uh, situation for the centripetal force with minimum speed is that the centripetal force must just be equal to the force of gravity, or the force of gravity needs to be the only force required to keep you in circular motion. The definition of centripetal force is mac, okay, F equals ma, Fc equals mac, but the definition of ac, the centripetal acceleration, is v squared over r. And that's the V that we're looking for. In fact, let's cancel out the M's. Let's rename the V V min because it's the one we want. V min squared over R is equal to G. And we get the classic result by multiplying over our R. V min squared is equal to GR. And the square root of both sides says that V min is equal to square root GR. In part C, we're asked, what is the new required entry speed v naught prime at the bottom of the loop such that the conditions in part B apply? So how much speed do you need at the beginning to make sure you have exactly the right minimum speed at the top? For that, let's go back to conservation of energy, but let's rename our final point. This time our final point is all the way at the top. And let's consider our energies. As usual, in the beginning, we have kinetic energy only because we're on the ground. One half m v squared. But this time, we don't know this v. It's v naught prime, the very one that we're looking for. On top of the loop, we've done something interesting where we've actually gained some height. And of course, that height is equal to the diameter of the circle. We know that as 2r. So the potential energy we have at the top is equal to mgh, but this time h is 2r. So we have mg2r, or to be more proper, 2mgr. We can add this to the definition of the kinetic energy that we now know that we have because we have acquired that minimum velocity. The kinetic energy is 1 half m v min squared, but of course v min was equal to square root gr, so we're going to substitute that since we were only supposed to give answers in terms of m, v naught, r, and g. So rad gr squared, or should I say just gr. Now we may cancel all of these m's which appear in each piece of the equation on both sides, giving us 1 half v naught prime squared is equal to 2 gr plus 1 half gr. I believe that those on the right side there are like terms, so we're going to do a simplification there. If I take 2 and I add 1 half, I get 5 over 2. So I have 5 over 2 gr for the right side of the equation. I will multiply both sides by 2. v naught prime squared will be equal to 5 gr when I cancel out the 2 I brought with the one that's already there. And so v naught prime, the required velocity to reach the top, is square root 5 gr.